All right, welcome back, Red Spotters. Another show here in the Red Spotlight Podcast. I'm your host today, Alexis Soto, joined by Peter Martinez. And we have got a movie review for you today. You know, the show that brings you all of the latest stories coming out of the world of movies. And we've got quite a big one for you, although, of course, judging by box office, you wouldn't know it exists. But, of course, um, (laughs) in the um, film fan, film Twitter community, I should say, it is the It movie right now, the new It Girl. Uh, We're talking about um, everything, everywhere, all at once. A new film uh, from the Daniels, who previously... Mm -mm, uh, Just just Daniels. From Daniels, um, who previously brought us a film with um, Harry Potter as a floating corpse. uh, Or as a corpse. Uh, Swiss Army Men, I should say. You know, what's really funny about Swiss Army Men. I remember watching it for my top 10 of 2016 mm-hmm. and I loved it uh-huh. I loved it so much that I think I tried to get Kyle to watch it when we first started to the table uh-huh. and I could tell he was like beyond disinterested like he he wouldn't go for it how could you tell that because I tried <laughs> And he, you know how he gives this sort of runaround where it's like he won't say no, but he sure as hell won't say yes either. <laughs> was he trying to change the subject? That kind of thing, yeah. Well, he would just like leave it there and then try and move on to get mm-hmm. away from answering the question? Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. By the way, <laughs> Kyle Lyra, um, our good friend Kyle Lyra. Um, amazing well, friend. Well, at times, amazing friend. Um, interestingly, he is a very busy guy these days. Um, but then again, so are we, right? So it's not oh, as yeah. if like we're recording this and like we're like fresh face. No, we've had long days, and you know, it's it's not um, easy keeping up with all the, as we see in the tagline, latest stories coming out of the world of movies. But it's it's interesting. Um, you know, Kyle does his best, um, I guess, to keep up with the things that he's interested in. But it doesn't seem that he's quite interested in a lot of things. I uh, I told you over the weekend I had a conversation with him and he had no idea what Arcane was. By the way, that also is proof that he doesn't listen to our podcast whatsoever or keeps I up know. with what we're talking about because I we mean, who have doesn't? discussed that show. <laughs> <laughs> who doesn't know what Arcane is? Um, okay. By the way, again to keep up with this bullshit. Uh, he, last I spoke, he, uh, has told me he hasn't finished Peacemaker yet. Again, the guy that for years and years and years would rub it in all of our faces that nobody was a bigger Guardians and James Gunn fan than he was. Well, evidently, that no longer seems to be the case because months later he has refused to finish James Gunn's first TV show. All the while, of course, he's obviously caught up with Moon Knight. Well, I guess you can say it's two episodes so far, but he did say when we we, we said like, hey, you watching Peacemaker? He's like, oh, I don't watch week to week. And he's watching Peacemaker week to week. No, Moon Knight. No, sorry. Moon Knight week to week. So, yeah. He Mm. even told me he didn't even want to discuss Moon Knight on our chat because he knew this would be thrown in his face. <laughs> so he knows. So he could just, like, not lie about it. <laughs> so he gave you the runaround of yeah. Swiss Army Man a few years ago. Which yeah. is funny because, um, I'm sorry, but wasn't, like, in those days, wasn't he all four, you know, to the table? Why would he not be yeah. interested in that movie? For whatever reason, he wasn't. And, you think and, that and would again, be a film he'd like or be interested in? Well, least. obviously, I thought that because I offered to show it to him. <laughs> I wanted him to see it because that's a great film, too. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it has a lot of the same... It's like Weekend at Bernie's kind of? Oh, no. Well, I well, mean, you got, a, you got a corpse. Yes. And it's being used around. But it's very weird. That might surprise you. And it has the same sort of childish humor and beating heart and love of film. It, it's it's very much infused into that film. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. That's what made me so excited for this film. Because it's like Daniels. Like, 
I loved their last film. And yeah. Interesting. And I mean, interestingly, of course, with as few projects, actually, I shouldn't say few, but Kyle is very selective these days about what he, I guess, spends his time watching on. Oh, yeah. Um, but evidently, this is one of the projects he was interested in, and he did come and see it with us um, in the theater, which is the only place you can watch this film, and I would recommend you do. Again, our full review will be later on, again, so... Stay tuned for that one. Uh, but speaking of Kyle, um, and putting putting the hilarity to the side, um, and putting to the side, of course, that he yet again has delayed something, but said something is happening one way or the other this month, and that would be finally our favorite films of the year two thousand and twenty one. That is right; it is coming. Pretty, pretty soon. I would say it is quite imminent. I'm no longer looking at it every day, which means, yeah, I'm, I'm You're done. You're locked in. I'm, I'm locked in. I'm locked in. The top ten's locked in. All the other films are in the positions that they fell, and I'm not looking about it. I'm not thinking about it anymore because I've already – my mind's already moved on. Mm-hmm. As soon as the Oscars are over, I'm – I mean, I'm still like – I still have films that I'm rewatching just to like – because I need something to rewatch and I am thinking about it, but like really like as far as like <clears throat> where they're placed, um I'm not changing anything and I'm ready to go <laughs> and I'm ready to discuss it. Um but uh it seems we were kind of delayed a few days or a week or so. Um and we have no one but the Catholics, ironically enough, to thank for that, because of course they insist on going all out for Easter. That is true. I mean, it is their, like, deity. Yeah, Sort I know. of risen. I guess yeah. it's a big thing for them. I'm sorry, know. but I'm a little pissed that my podcast got delayed because... Listen of... here, Jesus. <laughs> if that even is your name. Because poor translation <laughs> may have been off about your name. Uh, I got a podcast to run, okay? Yeah, literally, and it's like getting in the way, and as if I don't have enough problems, you know, um, getting this particular show um, scheduled in the first place, but, you know, hell or high water, it's going to come at the end of this month, and uh, I'm really excited for the conversation, I'm excited, really, to see what movies you guys pick, and um, also with the new format. Um, that we're going to be trying out. Mm-hmm. Usually how we've done it in the past, we've literally just like given all of our honorable mentions and the actual list rankings at the, like all at once, as in one person would basically unveil all of that at like at once. And that would take the better part of 45 to 60 minutes each, which would easily be over a three hour podcast. Now, this particular change in format that we're changing it to is not really geared towards cutting the runtime. It's more with producing a better flow and getting a better back and forth. Cause what I found, especially with 2020s show was it was too much of one person just sucking up all the oxygen and everybody else was just like silent. And I kind of want to get away from that. And so what's going to end up happening is we are going to actually like uh, do a little bit of a, I don't know what the right word for it would be, but I'm going to reveal my number 10 and then Peter will reveal his number 10 and then Kyle will talk about his number 10 and then we'll all do the exact same thing again for our number nines, eights, sevens, and sixes. And then in the middle of the episode, we will um, go back around to reveal what were our honorable mentions, you know, to create a little bit of suspense as we go Mm -hmm. along through this process. So I'm... I'm quite geared up for it, shall we say. Mr. Soto um, is promising suspense as well. Um, oh yes, um I had I'd mentioned for I think weeks now that there were some some choices in my top 10 that are I think in some ways quite chaotic. <laughs> um I shall be the judge of that. Well, of course, you made yourself judge, jury and executioner, right? Years and years ago. Emphasis on executioner. It seems that way, yeah. Um, There are several films in my top 20 favorite of the year um, 
that are at the very least divisive. Mm. If not, and div- divisive in the, in the sense that half of the people hate those films and the other half either love it or are mixed on it. So it's interesting. And it's, I think really overall, this for me, just to say where, just to say like where my head space is at right now, between all the content that I'm rewatching or the new stuff that I'm watching, whether it be on television or in movies, especially through the movies, a lot of the stuff that um, came out last year and even the new stuff that's happening right now, I'm just like, I'm so reinvigorated in this world, man. I know there's a lot of like toxic stories right now between the whole like bullshit with not with the blowback that is I honestly kind of overdone and annoying now with Will Smith. And I'm not talking about it anymore between that and, you know, Ezra Miller and Johnny Depp derailing the fantastic and J.K. Rowling derailing the Fantastic Beast franchise to the kind of hilariousness that is the disaster of Morbius and then also the head scratcher of Sonic the Hedgehog to opening to seventy one million dollars and its opening weekend. You know, even even in the midst of all of yeah, I'm tell I've I've been saying it. <laughs> the kids love Sonic. Why I, I don't I don't know, but it's look it's uh, yeah. In the midst of, and even in you know, in the midst of Coda somehow being proclaimed the best picture of two thousand twenty one, in the midst of all those negative stories. There is still so much I find to just be excited about the state of film as far as the quality. There's so so much. I mean, right now, we just finished watching, well, not today, but like recently, Mm -hmm. we have watched uh, Everything Everywhere All at Once. And then now, The Northman is going to be coming out very soon. And then also Men, which is, by the way, hilarious title. And it's I love so how it, I laugh every time it comes. <laughs> the title. And I love that Kyle laughed, too. And he I think he was his first time seeing that trailer. And when the yeah. title came up, but it comes from Alex Garland, the brilliant mind that brought us Ex Machina. And of course, the very I mean, Ex Machina is very, I think, adequately rated, mm-hmm. but it was definitely underrated is Annihilation. I, oh, my God. I love Annihilation. Um. So, and then just uh, in the Northman, which is brought to us by um, Eggers, Robert yeah. Eggers, who uh, did The Vich and then also The, Vitch. the Lighthouse. Yeah. Two films that both you and Kyle adore completely. Mm-hmm. Also films that a lot of the public do not care for. But hey, that's that's how it is. What do they know? <laughs> right. What do they know? And then that's just the tip of the iceberg, because just in these next two months, we've also got that new Nick Cage movie that looks sensational. Oh, yes. That looks a lot of fun. Where Nick Cage is playing Nick Cage. You know, say what you want, but there is a new Sam Raimi movie coming out. That is true. And speaking of that, um, little by little, I have allowed myself to feel a little bit of excitement about the film in the sense that there is a new Sam Raimi film coming out. And despite the fact that it happens to be... um, the 27th to 28th film in this like um, cinematic universe. And it is a blockbuster made in this particular era. Despite all of that, it is interesting to me how already just based on trailers and previews, the direction and a lot of the craft choices already are operating at a level that quite frankly eludes 99% 99% of Marvel movies. Yeah. just so, And you can see it in the previews. Mm-hmm. Um, the interesting, and shall I even say, um, <laughs> bold for MCU choices, he, the way he uh, moves the camera around and some of the shots that, he's, that he collects and even uh, something as simple as the cinematography being allowed to be interesting and show off some colors. The fact, as you said, there are people actual like real like extras on the set the fact that there are sets have you seen the behind the scenes that have come out um from the director's chair and there are sets there it's like this is like bottom of the barrel expectations that marvel has repeatedly failed to meet yeah and yet as soon as you get in raimi the fact that this stuff exists and is present it shouldn't excite me but it does <laughs> i will, they had like a little trailer with like some little behind the scenes stuff uh-huh and the thing that excited me is just him there in his classic suit. Yeah. <laughs> his, his his movie suit. 
and it, and it just reminded me like Sam Raimi has a new movie coming out like it's I how good it's gonna be I don't know but I can't stop myself from being excited at the thought of a new Sam Raimi film <laughs> right right I just and I can't yeah and again like we have to keep in mind of course um this isn't a film. And again, Sam Raimi obviously has evolved and grown over the years. There mm. is obviously an experience, or shall we even say an ordeal, in making the, the last Spider-Man movie he did with Sony, considering all the stories that have come out with what Sony changed and wanted him to do with his film. And I would still contend that regardless of how how much of a fiasco that must have been, I still contend Spider-Man 3 is a great movie. Mm -hmm. Um, despite all of the things that he was forced to do. So keeping that in mind, maybe this time around, considering that he's had experience with him working with people that are not necessarily in line with what he wants films and his vision to be, perhaps consider, because this is a film that is written by Michael Waldron, who did the Loki series. I don't, I, I have to assume Raimi co-wrote parts of this script. I'm and, sure he went in there and, and yeah. did did some refinement. There, yeah, you've seen the footage. There's all the evidence you need that he has had a tremendous influence on how visually this one will look like. <laughs> and then maybe even creatively as well, considering the runtime will be two hours and six minutes. Which is pretty astonishing considering reports that the film went into deep reshoots late December to add in extra surprises and cameos. Um, it, it's, <laughs> well, I, I, I'm sure you've said this on some podcasts at this point, the multiverse aspect is hard to get excited about because I have seen the greatest multiverse movie that will ever be made. Into the Spider-Verse, previously it, held that into title. Into the Spider-Verse. <laughs> um. <laughs> no i literally just said that the last podcast i had yeah. to re-record the moon knight podcast because my audio ended up being shit for uh, uh it was a snafu that happened so david and i had to re-record the moon knight um recap episode but it was a good opportunity because i had to basically i had a marvel audience with me and I, and the first thing i talked about was not marvel but it was everything everywhere all at once and i opened with the fact that that movie um exists in part because daniels was like um no to loki yeah just like no <laughs> which god is so him. funny god bless him right so, um you know. and, so, I, and i even said that considering we've, we just said a lot of um interesting things that gets us excited about multiverse of madness but i opened up that podcast saying that everything everywhere all at once mm -hmm. being a really great multiverse story kind of kneecapped the multiverse of madness movie well yeah at this point the multiverse aspects is not what excites me about no not Doctor in the Strange. least no what excites me is a the idea of a goofy and strange you know pun intended and somewhat scary yeah um sam raimi uh film <laughs> That happens to star Doctor Strange. That's what I, that's the aspects that I'm excited. like. Um, I saw like the classic in that whole besides behind the scenes thing. They had the classic shot of like, like the 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 zoom in uh camera turn to like doors slamming like yeah, and then you know people looking all in shock as it like the camera yeah. comes uh, turn, and I'm just like Ugh! like that. That excites me, not like, who's going to pop up that you may or may not. I don't give a shit. Show me some, like, weird, uh, scary, funny Sam Raimi goodness that happens to star Doctor Strange. I'm in heaven. That's, uh, that's, that's, that's what all, I want. Yeah, that's all I want as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, there have been some contradictory stuff that has come out, though. I mean, seemingly what flies in the face of what we just said and the fact that the runtime is just basically two hours, mm -hmm. which, by the way, isn't keeping with how most of Remy's films usually have been as far as the length of them, um, comes this report that some insider at the studio has teased, quote-unquote, that this multiverse of madness has more surprises than Infinity War, Endgame, and No Way Home combined. And something doesn't track there. At what point is that sort of just like a, a marketing 
a tactic. Sure. I mean, all yeah. of it should could could be to an extent. But let's suppose for a second it's true. Mm-hmm. How? It's not. Can you it's do, not possible. It's not. You you brought back um, Toby Spider Man. You can't get bigger than that. I'm sorry. They, as far as I'm concerned, they have no more cards to play in the surprise factor. Um, I mean, one of them we already know, which is uh, Professor X. Yeah. Which I would have said, like, that's maybe the only one left. Other than that, I don't know. Well, what's the biggest surprise that could happen? I mean, it's like, all right, well, Tom Cruise, but okay, that'll be for like, what? It's uh, it's a cute Easter, like, egg if you know the history, but like, yeah, other than that, like, who knows, who cares kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe they mean like, (laughs) (laughs) uh, no, Uh, like evil Wanda is like a a surprise, you know, because Wanda is the the main villain of this Mm -hmm. film, as, as you all know. Um, I'm, I, I'll say this, however you feel about her, Grace has been very correct when it, when she has come to her Marvel leaks. Mm-hmm. I think her Marvel leaks. For those who are been... listening, we're, we're divorcing that from her takes. That's oh, a yeah, different yeah, yeah, thing yeah. altogether. Of course. But the accuracy of her Marvel leaks have been impeccable. Yeah. I think. I, I mean, I followed everything and they've pretty much always come True. When it comes to mm-hmm. her Marvel leaks, so I would say, going off of what she has said, which is basically "Don't expect Spider-Man No Way Home," where she's basically like, "Just expect a Doctor Strange slash yeah. Scarlet Witch film." Um, I'm gonna go with that, and it just so happens to be what I want to. So, <laughs> well. Things are definitely trending in a positive direction, that's for sure. I'm a lot more uh, interested in this film than I was even like a week ago. So that's good. It's good for that. Um, and it won't be that far away from now. It's basically less than a month away. Yes, yes, yes. So we're practically already here. So, And the, the box office seems healthier. A lot healthier than as, as far as it did even just in December and yeah. in November. So I mean, we went... I went to go see an A twenty four film twice. Yeah, this week. Oh, three times if you count this uh, year. X. X. That's right. And while n- obviously none of the theaters were full, mm-hmm. there was to me there was a sizable enough audience in all three for A twenty four standards. And yeah. in, in in our community, it was through the roof. Mm-hmm. Um, but even as far as like um. Overall, box office is concerned. The Lost City has been a hit. Um, Scream, Jackass, Sonic—they've been hits. Um, Morbius was not, but even even with um, you can see this is the power of of the the Marvel name. Even Morbius was able to score what like forty or fifty million in its opening weekend. That's oh my god! That's so much more than it deserved, right? And yet, see that that's just that's really the unfair advantage Marvel is working with. Mm-hmm. The, the Morbius people, like, really? Um, well, is he's a Marvel legend? Yeah, sure. That's that's what they were trying to sell him. That mm-hmm. also, it'll be curious to see how um, Dumbledore performs. That's for sure. Because evidently, from what I've yes. read from Variety, Warner Brothers has officially pumped the brakes and are waiting to see how the film performs. To see if the next two films that reportedly were in development years ago in this like five movie saga are even going to get made. Well, I mean, that's a smart move because I mean, it's about time they've made that move. Yeah. I mean, quite frankly, they were really dumb to, to just like throw um, J.K. Rowling as a sole screen ri- screenplay writer for her first screenplay she's ever written in mm-hmm. the first Fantastic Beast, and then even further so with Crimes of Grindelwald. Yeah, they. I will all... say, uh-huh. I will say, um, I'm. I hope it does well. Uh, just purely from, as a Mads Mikkelsen fan, because from the trailers he looks pretty good in the role, and from what I hear, hilariously, like I, everybody agreed that Johnny Depp was the best part of Grindelwald, and that he was good as that character. 
from what I hear, Mads Mikkelsen's even better in the role. Yeah. So, which I mean, it fits. He's he's a great actor. Just profess your love already. I know. I I think I just did. (laughs) Um, because you're like he looks good. Yeah. Well, which is a lot more than uh, in the role. (laughs) Yeah. And it's a lot more than he would say to Dumbledore in China. Uh, cause those, apparently there was like six oh God, seconds right. of lines that out. were, were, mm-hmm. um, removed. See, a lot of people think that that's a bit much, but those six lines were, you know, I'll gargle on your dick, which I, <laughs> which, which I mean, I guess that is maybe a little too far if you want to show it to the kids, you know? I mean, it is PG-13. Oh, so it's PG. Okay, okay. Yeah, PG-13. I mean, it's yeah. not like it's uh, NC-17 I don't know, rating. I don't know the ra- the rating system in China, but, you know, yeah. yeah. It's funny, because a lot of uh, films that are rated R here are, like, PG, or, like, the equivalent of, like, PG or G mm-hmm. in, like, Canada or, like, the UK and stuff like that, which is pretty funny. And you know why that is? Mm. It's kind of, um, well, with China, it's just homophobia. But with us... Well, for a lot of places, it's just homophobia. Oh, yeah, for a lot of places. But for the United States, it's because, like, we have a thing about cussing, and we have a thing about, like, sex. Right. So and any... then you mix in a little bit of toxic masculinity and homophobia in there, so... Yeah. Dumb. Dumb, dumb, dumb. Yeah. So, that's... uh. That'll be interesting, and I'm curious to see if our Potterheads, um, Moreno and, and Kyle, go check out that film. I mean, by all indications, it is better than the previous two. Yeah. That isn't, that, that isn't saying that it's good, still. Yeah, what that means, I don't know. <laughs> but I mean, I guess a sign of improvement is a good thing, right? Mm-hmm. I guess. If it's a step in the right direction. Yeah, but the phrase too little too late also exists, so. Yeah, especially when you're three movies in. And you're barely getting it, getting in the right direction. It mm-hmm. reeks of like how the DCEU imploded, basically. Yeah. Speaking of which, I guess WB is considering what to do with Ezra Miller. Um, evidently, reports have come out that there are seeking options. I can't imagine if things, if this behavior keeps up, that film will come out, and that that'll be the last we see of his Flash. And then I guess they'll move on with a different Flash. <laughs> they'll bring in the girl Flash. Yeah, it's going to be an all woman <laughs> DCEU girl. Yeah. Power. Yeah. The uh, WB makes some makes some great movies. They make some of the best movies these days. Mm-hmm. And yet um, they have some of the worst scandals. Um, when you gamble, uh, you win big and lose big. <laughs> And they've and they've done both of those things, mm-hmm. absolutely. So there is all that. But overall, generally speaking, I'm just so happy with the quality of films that I am getting. Um, and it's really hard for me to recall a time where I felt this way because not only am I coming off the high of the previous year's like stellar like cast of films, but we're already already we're hitting the ground running with just great quality all around. And even things that I haven't seen evidently have gotten great reviews, like even that Jackass Forever film or the Scream fifth, the, the fifth? Or yes, was it, the fifth? it was the yeah. fifth one, yes. yes yeah. Yes. So, yeah. There are clunkers and, and, you know, and stinkers as they usually are, but for the most part, it's a pretty good time to, to watch movies. And I'm looking forward to seeing more of them and talking about more of them. So, there we have that. Um, getting into what we saw this week... Because, of course, that is a segment we so love to bring up. Um, and kind of coming off of what we were just saying about, you know, all the different films. Um, I am rewatching several of them in preparation for a top 10 of 2021. And some of the ones I re in the last week was Dune. And Dune is I've heard oh, of that. kind of a perfect movie. Like, um... The intrigue is there, but the quality is there. The craft especially over-delivers. The acting is incredible. Um, and so many of the visuals, it's just like, this is everything like, it's not cinema. only like, it's not just like the best, it's not like, not only is it like immediately like top tier blockbuster movie making, 
but it's basically what the best of cinema can do is that it absolutely transports you to a different place in time. Mm -hmm. Completely immersed in this entire universe. Um, And they do a wonderful job of, there's so much like, I think maybe for an initial viewing from what I recall, you get the gist of things, but with like subsequent viewings, you catch so much more and then you really appreciate so much detail that Denis Villeneuve was able to just kind of squeeze in there. And it really kind of like, it makes you just think so much more of what an accomplishment it was to really translate to film. This was a property that for many decades, people were like, from what I hear anyway, not that I was there for those decades of what I've been told, people have said that this was kind of like um, unadaptable. Uh, because yeah. and you you yourself have said as a fan of the book that it's just it was just difficult to translate and there have been previous a- attempts at translating it to um well various uh degrees success. of success yeah and then this of course being the pinnacle of it um with how great it is and um just these wonderful characters that score is just so all encompassing um yeah man it's 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 a great film it's a great cast and i'm sad that um i can't see the next part like i don't know right now <laughs> that's but it's a great movie um and definitely should have gotten the best directing nomination at the very least if not been a contender um i mean the the film itself is just like <sighs> big it's just real big <laughs> um but hey coda was the best movie of the year, so let's remember that. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, I also uh, rewatched uh, West Side Story. Uh, Peter uh, actually heard me listening to the soundtrack before we um, began the podcast, um, and it's fucking great. <laughs> <laughs> like I saw that film, like I think it was the most. Um, it is the film I saw the most times in a theater last year, which was a grand total of four times. That's a lot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I rarely dish it out, like, four times. Like, um, for reference, I saw The Last Jedi four times in theaters. So. I didn't see dude. it four times in theaters, but I saw it many times when it was available. Fake fan. On Blu-ray. Fake fan. <laughs> I saw it three times, I think. Um, four times. Yeah. Okay. I, I got okay. you there. Yeah. Okay. That's what I remember. Yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I saw Batman three times. I minutes. saw it. Did I see it once? No, I think you saw it twice. I think I saw it twice. Yeah, you and I saw it together twice. Yes, 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 yes. It was mm-hmm. twice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, it. So yeah, no. West Side Story is a. Uh, it's just. It's a beautiful film to look at. It's one of those films where the craft is just so beautifully on display. The singing is so so fucking good. The acting is incredible. Um, and I'm just. It's one of those films that you're so like you're so sucked into, and it's like Kyle told me like when he his experience watching it the first time months back was like this is this just feels like an old-fashioned movie and be- i mean it is because it's like west side story mm-hmm. the original west side story film came out in 1960 and that was an old-fashioned film but it's like to me like the more i think about like the differences between these two versions like this one with spielberg is a much more like much more of a film version of it whereas especially with like not just the camera work but the sets and everything it's just so much bigger you think back to the 61 uh, movie, while it is a film, a lot of the sets very much still feel like they're like part of a Broadway stage play. Yeah. No, this, so. is, this is a film. Mm-hmm. Just um, the shots, the way the camera is moving, the way it takes you, the journey is just, God, it's beautiful. It's perfect. It absolutely is. I love it. Um, and on top of all of that, I've been listening to a lot of scores lately. Um, Hans Zimmer's score for Dune, um, Michael Giacchino's score for the Batman. Of course, uh, this one, uh, Leonard Bernstein, um, the version here from 19, from 2021, 1961, sorry. Um, what was it? Oh, I love Drive My Car's score. I don't know if you've listened mm-hmm. to that one lately, but it's such a wonderful, like it really, I, I just get into it. 
Of course, uh, Ramin Dejwadi's score for Returnals. I mean, you were listening to some of those tracks when you were with me. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, you know what's really underrated, though, for me? Um, Dan Romer's score for Luca. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really underrated. Let's like, go back and listen to the detail there. Um, and then also, Everything Everywhere All at Once. I was listening to their scores. So a lot of these kind of pair together pretty well. So um, pretty good uh, time for movie scores. Which is, I think, also, I think, quite appropriate because I know there was a like a side topic years ago about how like movie scores just weren't that great anymore. With blockbusters, yeah, but overall, they've been, been getting some pretty good scores. Yeah, well, no, I, I would agree. So there's that. <laughs> um, what have you been seeing? Not much. No, um, I uh, <laughs> I think I watched the first three or maybe it was two episodes of a show called Our Flag Means Death. Where's that show on? HBO Max. Uh huh. Is it HBO Max original or HBO original? I think it's a Max original. Interesting. Okay. It's a new Taika Waititi show. Oh, well, that explains why you were watching it. <laughs> there we go. There was the missing piece. Um, it's you a... think also that would be on Kyle's radar, but evidently, I don't no. think it would be. <laughs> it's a comedy show about the first, or, or about a, a real life, of course, unbelievably loosely, but I guess it was a real life individual called a gentleman pirate. Uh-huh. And it was like this... Um, posh gentleman fellow who one day you know very rich owned all kinds of land that he was born into had a wife and two kids and one day he left it all to try to become a pirate captain (laughs) and i guess that 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 was a real life thing that happened so this is pirates Yes, that would pirates. really be up Kyle's alley then. Yes, 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 yes. And the gentleman pirate is played by, I don't know the actor's name, but in the original What We Do in the Shadows film, he's the head werewolf. He's the one, he's like, we're, you know, we're werewolves, not swearwolves. I see. Uh, so, I know, know who that is. I don't know the name, but I know Yeah, yeah, I don't know his actor. I don't know his name. Um, English actor, you know, whatever. Um, so yeah, I've been watching that. It, it's the kind of humor I think you would that you're def- that you I would think w- it okay. is. Yeah, and I mean, it's like a white TD, so that mm-hmm. gives me a pretty good idea. To think I, of what we do in the shadows, both the show and the movie. I haven't gotten to it yet, but apparently he is. Well, he directed the first episode, Taika Waititi, mm-hmm. and. And apparently he makes an appearance in the show. Again, I haven't gotten that that far into it. I think only two or three episodes. And he makes an appearance as the dreaded Blackbeard. Um, they've been setting him up the first couple of episodes. Yeah. So, yeah. No, I've been enjoying it. It's It's been fun. <laughs> the humor you'd expect. So yeah, I don't know. I've 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 enjoyed it, and it's it's again only a couple of episodes. I don't know. I don't know how much I'll like it by the end, but mm-hmm. so far, obviously, really enjoying myself with it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anything else? And then another show I've been watching: animated show, also a comedy. Um, the what's it called? Let me. I, I had looked it up just to make 100% sh- Oh, Smiling Friends. It's a Adult Swim, a new Adult Swim uh, animated show. But they just put it on HBO Max. Mm. I have a feeling it's going to be a real big hit. Ah. Um, I, I really do. I, I think it might take a little a time. While. But it'll really take off. And because it's chaotic. Okay. Um, <laughs> if you think of the chaos in um, Everything, Everything, All at Once, very similar chaos 
within this animated show. There's like a million different animation styles within it as well. Um, it's the episodes are very quick. I think they're like twelve minutes, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's only ten of them, so it's it moves, but the it's it moves a mile a minute. It's very very funny, and I immediately was like, yeah, I really love this. It's it's um, <laughs> again humor wise, very much up my alley. Uh, the the first episode mike St staklasa of um red letter media voices um one of the main characters in the first episode interesting and yeah it's it's very funny but i mean other than that like yeah i not much else yeah, pretty much. Okay, and um, with that, I think we just about um, have uh, concluded all of the talk that doesn't um, pertain to everything everywhere, which means it is time to move on to the grand event of today's podcast. This is the movie review for the latest feature film by A24. Um, it's a big one. Yes, it is everything, everywhere, all at once. Directed by Daniels. Two Daniels. Uh, new year, new universe. An aging Chinese immigrant is swept up in an insane adventure where she alone can save the world by exploring other universes connecting with the lives she could have led. Unfortunately, this sweeps her up into an even bigger adventure when she finds herself lost in the infinite worlds of the multiverse. Cast. Wanda? Wanda. <laughs> Cast. Michelle Yeoh. Stephanie. Hsu? Hsu? Key Hugh. Hugh Kwan. A am I right? <laughs> am yeah. I right? Key Hugh Kwan. Okay. James um, no. Hong. No, 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 no. God it damn is... it. You just... Okay, so we got. Is it? It's Ki Hui Quan. Okay. Not Ki Hui. Ki Hui Quan. Yes. James Hong. Uh, Jamie Lee Curtis. So you know, also of Asian descent. Um, and a bunch of other people. Yeah, Jenny Slate's in there. A lot of people. And produced by two nobodies. So. That was actually a hilarious thing to discover, though. Like amongst all of this, think about this, right? So like this mm -hmm. film in all in all seriousness really kneecaps um multiverse of madness, like just off the bat. Like, <laughs> li listen, listen, like just think about this. Like it comes out less than a month before Marvel Studios' big multiverse event movie. The film is written by the the guys that Kevin Feige wanted to write his multiverse TV show. And it also happens to be produced by the golden boys from Marvel studio, Joe and Anthony Russo. That's a pretty hilarious, um, turn of events. I would say. I will say both me and Kyle, uh, laughed when the credits came up the first time. Mm -hmm. And you see, um, produced by Joe. Well, Russo that's not Anthony the first Russo. time. The first time the credits come up is in the movie. Oh, the final time the credits <laughs> come up. Because the first time you don't see the Russo thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's the second time when it's the real credits. So. I mean, I did laugh the first time the credits come up, but that was for a different reason. Uh, I mean... I'm 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 here in just utter suspense. What did you think of this yeah. film? Did was well, it uh, good? 
Real quick, though, um, if I'm not mistaken, you just read that description off Letterbox. Yes, I did. Sponsor, obviously. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, is this like, from what I heard, is this now the highest rated movie on Letterbox of all time? You know what? Even it surpassing is. Parasite. It's come like down a little bit. Uh huh. Used to be, I think it used to be a four point seven. Now it's a four point six. But yeah, it is the now highest user the rated. highest user rated uh, film. Well, I guess maybe it's tied with Parasite because now Parasite's at four point six. Um, let's just say it is. <laughs> uh huh. Mm-hmm. Um, what was your question? <laughs> I'm sorry, I just wanted to note that. <laughs> oh, do you think this movie is good? Um, did you enjoy it? There are a lot of people, um, not a lot of people, but let's just say there are some people who usually have a knee jerk reaction in in the negative. Um, way when they're told before they've gotten a chance to experience something uh, that when they're being told that this something they have yet to see is the best something ever or the best thing this or the best thing that and um, sometimes I will say I feel like a curmudgeon in the way that like I okay uh, I watch it and then I kind of don't get it and then I kind of don't care the most recent example I felt that way was with The Power of the Dog, which is a film that was really, really loved. And in some cases, I remember hearing on a podcast referred to as the best film someone had seen in over 20 years. And I think The Power of the Dog is a good film. I think it's a very good directed film. But with that um, level of enthusiasm, <laughs> it's a good film. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's good. I don't care. Ultimately, yeah. it's nice, but like, it's not. It's ultimately not what I think. Uh, the, the the film that people were like making it out because everybody was talking about it in the initial afterglow. Of the film, you know, opening. Uh, oh my god, this film's great, a masterpiece. Um, you know, and honestly, most of the times that I hear that personally, I'm like, okay, I watch it. Like, all right, all right, sure. <laughs> yeah. That that's kind of how I am with these things. Um, so it did make me a little bit concerned about how I would feel like when like the reactions came out, but only mildly so because I recall that trailer, the one that we saw several times in theaters before many films, has to be you know now in retrospect, one of the most like striking trailers. I've seen in years because I just knew like watching that trailer. It's like, this is going to be something like pretty damn good and something I already want to see. And you can already tell based off that trailer, <laughs> the definitive multi first story um, that will be told in cinemas for 2022. So I think all of these things we kind of knew off the bat to be excited about, of course, that it was by, you know, it was being distributed by a 24 also, you know, brings in that kind of excitement. So, ultimately, what do I feel about this movie? Um, wow. Um, I personally feel without this, hoping that this doesn't come across as hyperbole or over-exaggeration, and hoping, of course, that people understand that I'm not one that really likes to overhype things because I don't like the feeling of like disappointment with people who are like, you know what? I, I listened to that to that review of yours and I didn't see the same things that you saw in that and I kind of felt it was like blah or whatever. And okay, but sure. Mm-hmm. So I'm not I'm not I'm not somebody that goes out of my way to hype something. Um And I said this to David the last the last I said to him, and he was kind of like struck by what I said. But this is easily, and even more so now, you know, days after I had seen it, not once, not twice, which is another another aspect of this. Like this is a film I saw twice in its opening weekend, which I rarely do unless it's a big movie that I automatically like the first time. But even rarer 
it's a film you and I saw together on the opening weekend of it. Um, twice, not once, but twice. And the last time you and I did that, and I had to go back in my memory, was in 2017 when it was for Star Wars Episode Eight: The Last Jedi. That was the last time I think you and I had seen the film twice together on the opening weekend. And I think that really is indicative of like where this review in general is going. This is a long-winded way of saying, to me, Everything Everywhere All at Once is one of the best movies I've ever seen. Ever. In my life. I, quite frankly, when I saw this film the first time, I was pretty dazzled. I was pretty kind of like blown away. But I didn't appreciate it until the next night when I saw it again, just how blown away I really was. And then also on top of all that, because there's one thing to like say that you're blown away and dazzled and like it's a strong narrative and all these great aspects of it. That's one thing. It's another thing to say that all of that stuff works so much that you love it completely. You love it holistically. And it made a connection with you. And this thing... um, this is more than just a movie. It's more than just a great film. It's kind of a moment, really. Um, and I don't recall the last time I said something like that. And by the way, in case anybody's been asleep at the wheel, this comes off, I think, an unprecedented like streak, Peter, of like pretty much like nonstop positive reviews um, uh, for movies. Yeah, like, I can't. Th- this past year, I would say kind of was among my favorite if not uh yeah favorite years from film an amazing streak of wonderful films that i've adored and loved and for this to come along like i said just a month ago it would be hard for anything to really top how i how much i love the batman well not only was that within like the start of a month already like knocked off again that's not knocking the batman i love the batman mm-hmm. very much so it's going to be really hard to see how this movie gets knocked off my number one spot for 2022 off the bat. This is a film I'm so passionate about already and kind of um, this needs a 24 needs to get its shit together and needs to get some friends in the industry to get a best picture campaign launched for this movie. Yeah. And best actor campaigns for several of the ensemble here. Um, this probably is the will be the best multiverse story ever told already. And by the way, that's hilarious because there's there are several multiverse <laughs> films that are gonna come, you know, in the wake of all of this. The cast is sensational for a you know so many reasons, but ultimately it's it's got a it's kind of like an assimilation of these different kind of genres. It's got great action, it's got witty, wonderful um humor in it ridiculousness that will kind of leave your your jaw on the floor but then also laughing and appreciating it all at the same time but it's not without like cause it's definitely all there for a wonderful touch of heart that i always look for in the films that really mean something to me um michelle yo let me tell you something gives the performance of a lifetime it gives she gives a kind of performance you automatically just want to like cancel the Oscars and hand her the Oscar. <laughs> and I would say the same thing can be said for Ki Hui Kwan and then also <laughs> Jamie Lee Curtis and then also especially James Hong. Like and also I think what was it? Miss Sue? Um what was her first name? Um she's also I think this is her first big movie as well. Um Oh, the the daughter? Yeah. Um She is Stephanie. Yeah, Stephanie is wow. A lot of things in this film, quite frankly, are wow. And the more I think about it, the more I'm left with like, run, don't walk to see this film, please. This is this is um this is special. It really is. Um, I gotta say, I'm not a fan of your review. Mm. Okay. Um I love where this is going. Uh because I have nothing left to say. <laughs> what? <laughs> because I I just I agree. 
we're just getting started. I mean, these I are know. just observations, initial yeah, takeaways. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no, it is this thing of like, it does sound very hyperbolic. Yeah. And while I understand that, I'm sorry, it's also accurate. <laughs> it doesn't make it any less it true. It doesn't make it less true. Like, yeah, yeah, it's a it's a big accusation. And I'm making it like it, I, it's one of my favorite films immediately. One yeah. of my favorite films of all time. Mm hmm. Um, I don't I, think we've said that about a single film in seven years of podcasting. When we see it the mm -hmm. first week, the first, so. yeah, the, like the first time just going like, oh, yeah, favorite film of all time. Like, no, because no matter how much you love a film, it's like, well, you know. Give it time, let it just stay, you know, you, you, you want to see where, how you feel about it in a month, in a year, you know, does it stick with you, does it doesn't, you know, whatever. I, not this film. <laughs> it's, it absolutely is one of my favorite films of all time. I adored it. I saw it twice. So it's, it, it's not just the high of the, of the first viewing. It's it's just how I feel <laughs> about yeah. this film. Um, it's it's one of those films where it's like you feel like it's made for you. <laughs> yeah, honestly, yeah, uh, and feel like it's made for not only a film that is made for this time, but kind of defines it. Yes. Oh yeah. Um, it's it's one of those films that I just want to blow up. I want it to be a cultural mainstay i mm. want it to be i for the first time in a long time i give a shit about a film winning some damn oscars yeah that's <laughs> in parasite usually. and maybe that's the worst thing about this <laughs> watching this film mm. because i know because looking at parasite right like yeah the only way not the only way but the best way to get eyes on smaller films to such as uh, this one is to get awards, get nominated, yeah. get the buzz going. Uh, I think the, the, the best shot is a Michelle Yeoh. Um, I, I really think you could, if you campaign, mm -hmm. you can lock that shit you in. You hear that, A24? Get your shit ready. Get the campaign rolling mm -hmm. out. Get it ready. Get it, get it, it's a, the, 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 there's a whole story with Michelle Yeoh as well mm -hmm. that is definitely made for winning an Oscar. It's like yes. the, the materials are there for you to go ahead and do it as you wish. I would also add, of course, that the critics groups are, can also are very key at getting certain films seen. Drive My Car... Uh, this past awards season was one of those success stories where the film, again, this is a Japanese film. Um, not a lot of people are going to see this, um, but the critics definitely um, brought it to everybody's attention by awarding it several times over and over again. Yeah. The I same can be said of Spencer. These are films that probably would have gotten that attention. And while they didn't get Oscar gold, ultimately, well, Drive My Car did, but not, it didn't go all the way with Best Picture like Parasite did. Parasite was an exceptional mm -hmm. case. Yeah, no. Um, if they can pull through something like that, I would adore it. Um, uh, yeah, no. This, <laughs> it, it's just one of those films where there's just a million and a half different details that you can talk about. Little things, little performances, little gags, little visual cues. Where it's like, this is why I love movies. Yeah, that that you hit the nail on the head. Everything about the film, so many times I, I, I sat there in that theater, both viewings, and I'm like, I'm reminded about about why I love movies. Mm -hmm. This is exactly why I go I, I watch films. The way it's able to make you laugh and emotionally move you mm -hmm. to, um, I, I, I'm not a crier, so I didn't cry, but it's the equivalent to tears for me. Um <laughs> Uh, th the way it's able to wow you with fantastic action and choreography <laughs> yeah. and shots, the way it's able to dazzle editing you the editing oh my with gosh. fantastic. Well, that's part of editing, which is yeah. dazzle you with fantastic um effects. Yeah, 
and makes you just makes you sit there and think like, wow, how did they do that? How did they pull mm-hmm. that off? How did they make this look like this? Um, Considering, it, of course, it should be mentioned right now, the film um, took around 40 days max to, to just shoot. They insane. only had 40 days to shoot it. I mean, not that they only had, but they, they, they only did it. took them yeah. 40 days to shoot it on a $25 million budget. That's insane. On a $25 million budget, this film is easily one of the most visually dazzling and impressive movies made in the last 20 years. Mm-hmm. And that runs laps over films with hundreds of millions of dollars. By the way, it, it, it is, it's not, I don't know what genre you would put this film in, but to me, it plays like a blockbuster. I, oh, yeah. I, I thought that way so many times mm-hmm. because of how much is in it, how much variety is in it. Like, at, like, again, like it's not, it's hard to define a genre for it because like, you can't define it as a straight up comedy. There's comedy in it. You can't define it as a straight up drama. There's a lot of drama in it. But then there's also action. There's, yeah, like to me, like the but, whole time I was, I, I, I kept thinking blockbuster, blockbuster. Mm-hmm. Well, like the level of it, obviously, the level of action is not going to be. The scope is not the same as what you might be accustomed to today. But if you look at like classic blockbusters, I mm-hmm. would say it's on that level. Ah, right? yeah. Like, I, 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 it's, to me, if you look at the, the first Star Wars, right? Mm, yeah. And it's, it's a lot of running through hallways and <laughs> being in the desert. And then, you know, of course, you got the big climactic battle. But the big climactic mm-hmm. battle is just a lot of miniature um, ships yeah. flying in a straight line. Yeah, the uh, point being with that and everything everywhere all at once mm-hmm. is when you sit down and think about the actual locations mm-hmm. and the spaces they filmed, you realize this is actually was very economical to yeah. be able to actually get you know done but you don't think about any of that while you're watching the film because the film is so good at making you feel so transported Mm -hmm. and so invested in what's going on that's not something you think about while you're watching the film i mean a similar experience i could only imagine is like watching the first star wars or the first matrix or like some film equivalent where people went like wow like this is this game is changer. different this is a game changer basically um that's how i felt watching <laughs> this this movie i mean you yourself walked out of it with actually a pretty profound um statement with like w- w- kind of a declaration with like with this film it seems like there's been kind of like a paradigm shift in our culture in our society and, it, and and I guess it wasn't just this film, right? But just sort of speaking to recent films, I had I have noticed is that you're starting to see a lot more um, millennial and, and sort of that age generation filmmakers take the helm and sort of become the the storytellers, you know, Mm -hmm. for the, for this, this world, you know, this generation, right. You you see something with, and you see it in films like that we have seen recently everywhere, all at once, uh, Luca, turning red and Ganto. Um, there were, there's been other films, right? Um, Oh yeah. Oh, I, I, I guess I threw in the last Jedi too. Um, <laughs> but many other films, and oh, I would say also Mitchell's versus the Machines in a way. Oh yeah, for sure, Mitchell's versus the Machines. Um, it's this sort of. We we'll have to <laughs> hold hold on. Hold we on. have to uh, cut away now here because uh, we have a particular interruption by Peter's cat. As you may have heard, she frequently loves to um, 
go in and out of the bedroom as she pleases, and God forbid um, if anything stands <sighs> Sorry, in her my way. Cat gets claustrophobic. Yeah. Um, it's this thing where you're starting to see a different generation tell their stories, and their stories are very much oriented on. It's going to sound like cheesy and dumb, but like love and acceptance and sort of dealing with the sort of generational divide they've felt between them and their parents. And I think that's because a lot of, at least within the United States and maybe a lot of other similar countries, um the level of progress and just sort of the change in mentality between, you know, the millennial generation and the one that raised them has been pretty... Gen X, right? Uh, some Gen yeah. X, some boomers. Um, right. Mostly A boomers, mix. I think, yeah. with, with the later millennials. Um, the youngest millennials, maybe Gen X. Uh, the difference has been pretty wide i think in the way that they view the world and it has caused i think a sort of rift between you know those two sets of people and a lot of art reflecting that has by this sort of generation has been about accepting that and sort of facing the world through love in, in, in a lot of ways. Because a lot of these stories aren't about how bad and terrible their their parents are. It's about how to help them, how to heal them, how to heal mm -hmm. yourself, how to be kind to others, how to accept each other, how to make the world a better place um healing the world through love and it, and it sounds so cheesy you can slap it on a <laughs> i don't know a lunchbox slap it on a lunchbox and sell it but it's it's genuine and and it's <laughs> i think is beautiful and 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 something that i think resonates with me cuz i know we i don't think we've gotten to the spoilers for this film but there is a sort of within the third act, which the third act's pretty long ish. Mm -hmm. um, there is sort of this revelation about uh, Ki Hui, right? Ki Hui Quan, yes. Ki Hui, 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 Hui Quan's character that. <clears throat> I that just was I found so emotionally moving, right? Yeah. And so many of these stories I feel are are about how uh, the ones I've mentioned, not just this film but others are about sort of rejecting physical violence and sort of the catharsis of violence. Mm -hmm. And and sort of being being about defeating others and have it more about being through loving and accepting others and just all around just being kind um and i think that's pretty beautiful <laughs> mm -hmm. i think that's a good thing and because you know we talk about politics here a lot um there's a lot of reasons to be pretty down on the world and politics mm -hmm. many many endless reasons but the few things that uh don't keep me down and in fact give me hope are younger and younger generations mm -hmm. and the way you see that with each new generation it feels like people in this country are overall becoming more tolerant and all around more loving and kind 
and or at least trying to be <laughs> uh and i think that's a great thing and i think that's a beautiful thing and i and i just think that's starting to be reflected in the art that they put out so yeah that was my whole thing i mean uh, you could also go off of what you were saying there um i i, I can't also help but think about how how much good this will do to people who experience this and then like it influences them to make a change in their lives, not just for themselves, then also for, you know, to help strengthen their families and heal, you know, and remedy like rifts um, in ways that perhaps could not have been seen, you know, before the fact. And also in many ways helps reinforce the power of cinema. Art is transformative, right? Absolutely. And, and I think a lot of people, when they talk about the way film can affect them or influence them in life, you know, people can sort of like look down and be like, oh, how silly, how ridiculous. But it's like, it's art. Art moves us. <laughs> it always has. That's why we make it. Um, it's it, it has the, the ability it has to change the world is very well documented um so yeah there's no reason why film can't play a major part in that and i for me anyways i i can see this as a transformative film yeah and and i like you you know one of the central themes i would say of this movie is definitely to find um hope you know in in humanity by being kind and loving um the fact that this exists and the fact that people will see this gives me hope that um there is hope <laughs> you know that that there can in fact be a tomorrow that is better than right now that there can be a future where it's not just destruction and disaster and evil like we're seeing on a daily basis today. Mm -hmm. And it's another example that as the decades, you know, go by and the boomers and Gen Xers die off and the new generation um, take over and more importantly, take control as far as power is concerned, because of course the people who control our lives today, for whatever reason, are all in their seventies and eighties. Literally, every world leader, um, at least the the, the 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 Democratic Party is the worst offender of this. We have like an eighty-nine year old senator from our California here in the United States who apparently is suffering from dementia. No one wants to discuss it, but and she is being allowed to continue being the senator from California. Yeah. Um. So that's just an example. You would so. think there would at least be a law where it's like, if you have dementia, you can't be be a, an office. Yeah. <laughs> the most basic. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I know. You see, we can go on on many different tangents and rants here, but because this exists, and because there are people out there that reject a lot of the things that you and I reject, um, it just it's a reminder that. You just be patient, and one day, hopefully, things can be better. Not just in terms of politics, not just in terms of policies, but in terms of, like, you know, a, a can, an improvement in the material condition in people's lives, and therefore, an improvement in the quality of people's lives. Mm -hmm. So, ultimately, this was just a... I needed this for the soul, shall we say. <laughs> definitely, it's definitely. Chicken soup this. for the soul. Yeah, and for a while there, I wasn't sure because um, there are some twists and turns uh, toward the end of the film. And for a bit, I wasn't sure how hard it was going to go with nihilism. Like, there could have been an ending for this film where it basically could have been with the same ideological spectrum as Rick and Morty, where nothing matters. Mm -hmm. And because for, you know, for nothing matters sake. Oh, um, yeah, I think that that's what I also said, too. Is that I feel like there's, um, you know, 
you had it in the 90s and the 2000s there's there's there is this sort of level of like nihilism in a lot of art you can call it the rick and morty <laughs> effect effect um where it's like nothing happens nothing matters nothing cares and and, and that's kind of the point that's that's sort of yeah that's the point of what's being said and i feel like there's a, a lot of art today again based in that sort of, sort of same place as um the this pushback on like love and acceptance and kindness from that same place it is this thing of like pushing back on that nihilism too right where it's mm -hmm. like nothing matters right where it's like well this moment that made you laugh matters you know this 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 conversation you had with your daughter where you both opened up to each other that matters you want to say in the grand scheme of things it doesn't okay but it does because it means something to you right and that i find again because that to me speaks to me right because because we can talk about how and yeah of course the movie gets into this uh we are here for we are the universe experiencing itself in very small tiny bursts you know we're born we live we die uh what happens after that no one knows until they do um most likely from the evidence that we have we cease to exist and every most everything that happens in between then is random our existence is random and i think people can take that and they can either be extremely nihilistic and sort of angry about it or you can take that and you can find the meaning and the meaningless right and i think this movie really is a lot about finding the meaning in the seemingly meaningless which is kind of what life is about. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of this movie's coda. Mm -hmm. No pun intended. I it's mean, like I, my favorite quote in the movie, <laughs> which is, I think is the most moving part, is uh, in another life, I would have loved <sighs> to do laundry and taxes with you. Yeah. <laughs> Now I have nothing left to say because that that was, <laughs> that was the you, line. Was that your, that's the line, right? Because I I thought you were gonna go with the line where um Evelyn um is basically talking to Joy, her daughter, mm -hmm. about like um yeah there'll be a new discovery which will make us feel like even smaller pieces of shit, and yet even then I still want this, you know, mm -hmm. to, yeah. so to the effect of that and or that um. Even these, uh, if we only have these, you know, these passing fleeting moments and I will cherish these specs um, with them. I thought that that's the one you're going to go with. But no, obviously, the, what you said there um, <laughs> from uh, Wayman's character, Wayman, mm -hmm. uh, that says this in the film about like in, in another life, I would have loved and again, we're, we're saying all this out of context. We uh -huh. haven't really explained the film and everything, but like just for those who have going seen to. it, <laughs> this line here. Of like, in another lifetime, I would have I would have loved just doing laundry and taxes with you. It's like when I heard that, I was like, "Wow, <laughs> that's an all time great one right there." The delivery, the music, the the cinematography, all just comes the together. Build up of their God, relationship. Yes, yeah. Um, that's yeah. But <laughs> yeah, that but that that line was a mic drop. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. But no, that whole thing where she's like, yeah, they'll find another discovery or even more insignificant and stuff. And it doesn't make sense, you know, you know, basically saying like you're you're a shit daughter and I can experience a million other lifetimes where I'm the most successful person in the world and this, this and that. And yeah, it doesn't make sense because at the end of the day, I want to be right here with you. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I think 
the sort of oddball crazy randomness that's in the humor and the visuals and all of that speaks to that right Mm -hmm. it speaks to this sort of this idea of like yeah it's nonsense it doesn't make sense yeah these feelings that we have and this meaning that we find yeah it it doesn't make sense but it is but it still is despite not making sense um yeah it's it's beautiful Mm -hmm. it's a great film makes me want to go watch it again right now (laughs) maybe i will who knows Um, Uh, i i should also say i mean it should surprise nobody i've already ordered a poster so it's already on i'm crossing my fingers for what the home media release might look like Oh, I'll get that one way or the other. Yeah. <laughs> so you know how that would be like. but Because um, the poster, we should also say, Fantastic. the poster for this uh, mm-hmm. is one of the most striking posters we've seen in a while. Yes. It's actual art. It's not just floating heads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's actual art. Um, uh, no. Yeah. There's little details that I found out about the film afterwards mm-hmm. and by the way every detail that i find about this film just makes me love it more yeah that's um, the true mark of how much you love the movie and i'm there with you every little bit of material that i find out about like what it was like to make this movie what the mindset was about it just it, it makes me just appreciate how great it is that much more there's a certain reference to a certain film you and i both know what it is Kids, oh yeah, kids uh, film. Um, the person playing the puppet is voiced by Randy Newman. I knew it. And I, oh my god, there is a song that's played uh-huh. during the discovery. Something like "Now, yeah. now we're cooking" or something like that. Yeah. Also written and and sung by Randy Newman. <laughs> I thought I, I I heard Randy Newman's fucking voice in there somewhere. It was so random. I was like, is that Randy Newman? It's like, right, when were all this, like, chaos is happening? It's like, wait a minute. I, I know that voice. I know that voice. Mm-hmm. Just just the amazing little details mm-hmm. like that. Um, there's just so much thought and effort put into this film. And every detail makes me love it more. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I guess you can give the caveat that yeah, this film isn't gonna be for everyone. For sure, it's a mm-hmm. big crazy film. But I will say, it, like like we said, we we saw it with a moderate crowd, which is more than I thought would be. Two times, two twice, and in both instances, the um the audience was very much into it. I was stunned. Yeah. That that was the case. Mm-hmm. Um I mean look just to give you to give you all an example of how you know the reaction that we think we the film received as we were walking out of the film there was this guy that walked that just just randomly you know again this is part of the power of cinema right like this is where you know the randomness and strange strangeness of like communing with like people you don't know mm-hmm. about something you experience all together that's part of the magic right? But this guy was just saying, like, man, I cried five times. I, and clearly, the, the, and that's a kind of, that's a level of love and passion about, like, basically walking away from a film almost immediately that I hadn't really firsthand experienced um, from somebody else, I mean, mm-hmm. in a long ass time. And that was great to see. But it was quite stunning, as I said, to see both of those screenings with the film and what's definitely all the, the quirks that are, and, uh, uh, overt humor of a particular variety that is featured all throughout the movie and it being kind of like received so warmly and enthusiastically by again like our particular community I've said this time and again is a microcosm for the general audience and it's and I've seen A24 films with no audience because of you know how often I would say that these films are kind of ignored or avoided, but even the ones that do get an audience, um, the reactions vary. So I wasn't expecting 
the reaction or the or the the experience that we got and i was really happy about it and kind of i think really speaks to how good this movie is and it kind of also speaks to how far ranging far reaching excuse me it 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 may be even with all of the insanity that is um on display um it can touch people in the most basic of ways and i think that really is a testament to the quality of the film yeah um i mean i don't <laughs> i don't know if there's any anything specific you know we can say well maybe we can get well we can get specifics in terms of like without giving away anything substantial with the individual performances we can get oh, more detail sure. with them so we're talking about this cast so look this particular story centers around a chinese immigrant family we've got um the chinese immigrants and then we see them um middle-aged uh toward uh yeah, middle age. We've got our main character, our main duo here. Really, our main character is Michelle Yeoh, uh, who plays Evelyn Wang, um, and then her husband, who plays Waymond Wang. Um, that is, or who is Waymond Wang, and is portrayed by Ki Hui Quan. And then also we've got James legendary Hong. James Hong, who plays um, Evelyn's father. Evelyn's aging father, and then we've also got Stephanie, who plays their daughter Joy. Um, and it's an interesting dynamic because w the setting we have here with the Wangs is they emigrated from China, already in a, a dynamic that is that was you know contra um, her father's um, worldview, where he basically disowned her for leaving the family and leaving the country. Again, just a little bit of the dynamics here, but they mm -hmm. basically own a what a cleaners or a laundromat. Um, a laundromat, that's what it is. They own the laundromat, and that's all they do. And there's a family occasion, and there's a lot of anxiety uh, concerning taxes, a lot of uncertainty, and there's a lot of like inter um, familial um, conflict mm -hmm. that's at play here. And in the midst of all of that, the strangeness of all things happens. The multiverse cracks open, shall we say. Or the <laughs> multiverse is under attack. And somehow, this particular version of Evelyn Wang, our main character, is a pretty important figure. She's in the, the chosen one. <laughs> she's the chosen one in the vastness of this multiverse. So that's basically the gist of what the story is. Without, like, giving away too much of the... Um, Basically, what happens step by step by step. Mm -hmm. Um, and Evelyn Wang is man, I mean, I, I think you really have to start off with Michelle Yeoh. Like, part of what makes her performance, I think, feel so special is the fact that she has had a long career in this industry, and the thought struck me. You know, when I saw this, this is not the kind of performance I have heard people associate Michelle Yeoh with. And it seems very much the case that everyone, including herself, <laughs> would agree with that notion. Mm -hmm. Because it was pretty remarkable. This is a, a role that she had the ability to really flex her capabilities, not, not you know only in terms of physicality with the action sequences as you also see in the trailer but she gets to really um play with her comedic chops which i did not know she had and she is hilarious and, oh my god what a powerhouse she is with some of those emotional scenes hmm. wow wow she flexed <laughs> every acting muscle she in, in she did film. like she gave it her all in, in ways that no one really knew she could because she never really was given the chance to do that. Mm -hmm. And it was really, I have to say, um, 
that clip I shared with you, this was an interview that Michelle Yeoh did with G- GQ about what it was like meeting with the with with Daniels for the first time about um, doing this film. And she was speaking about how she doesn't like take on roles with people she doesn't get a vibe off of, uh, an enthusiastic vibe off of. Like she has to believe that the filmmakers themselves are passionate about the work that they're doing. Otherwise, she does not agree to do this mm-hmm. or any project she's well, involved. Of course, with. right. If the That's very she... people pitching you the film are don't seem excited yeah. about it, why? <laughs> well, not every actor is that way though. Like yeah. some actors are just there for the paycheck. That's true. But That's with true. her, yeah, with her, it's like it's it's important because she has to be away from family. So that's what she stressed. Mm-hmm. Um, why it was important for that to be the case. But then she she said that she had to really resist the urge to tell them in her initial sit down with them about how. Um important or how um special actually um it was for her to read the script and the fact that she was thought of to be the lead for their movie considering what the role demanded of her because and she got very emotional talking about this that she um she had been waiting such a long time in her career to get a script like this where she had the ability to show the people of our <laughs> to show everybody what she was capable of doing to be fun to be sad um and the last thing she said in that clip was finally somebody understood that I could do all those things <laughs> and i got to tell you peter when i first saw that clip i was like oh my god i'm just like i i felt the emotion because that her story unfortunately is a story of so many people in that industry where it's like they wait and they wait their entire careers And they never go to the places that they could have gone because the industry itself discriminates heavily against certain people. And again, none more so than Asians in this industry. Less than 1% of all leading roles in the Hollywood industry go to Asians or Asian Americans, if you will. Um, And so that is a particular group of people who have been so excluded. Many of them haven't had, you know, very long careers to speak of and with her it just makes you think wow had she been given the opportunity to be like this in so many other films just imagine the the the, the possibilities yes and so that in and of itself like makes her her performance here one for the ages and one that a different that story in particular is what the oscar campaign should be basically about but then on that note the very same, like another another casualty of you know the industry being as racist and as discriminatory as it is towards so many different minorities. Um, we'll also look at what happened with with Key. This is Key's first film in twenty years. Oh, it's probably thirty. Well, this is what he said in over twenty years, maybe close to thirty. This is uh Key, who is a child actor that's most known for Goonies and Indiana Jones and Temple of Doom. Um. Those are his most recognizable roles as a child actor in the 80s. And he dropped out of the industry in large part. And I think he said in recent interviews, not because he stopped liking the job, not because he stopped, you know, caring about acting, but that he just wasn't satisfied with the roles he was being offered. And he just walked away. And you know what? All the power to him for having the strength and courage to do that to walk away from the limelight because he wasn't happy with what he was being given. And of all things, um, and it's not a film you and I talk about in the positive context because it's just not a film that I think was made for us or that you and I would like, but Crazy Rich Asians was actually the film that changed Key's mind. Hmm. And that that's kind of the, that was the moment where he was like, he was like, you know what? Maybe it is time for me to come back. And so... This was his first performance in over two decades. And can we just say, it? you wouldn't tell that mm-hmm. he had not acted in two decades by watching this, this, this particular movie. What a revelation. And again, not a one-dimensional performance as well. So many different layers to the character or character, shall we say, that he has to play with here. Um, he, by the way, key gets the line of the film 
and delivers <laughs> it in the way that it should have been delivered. Yeah. And it's just like, I'm just so happy for him. And it's just amazing how amazing he was. Yeah, he gives he gives a performance like he's been acting nonstop for decades. Mm-hmm. Uh, like like it's one of those performances where it's it's like an actor that you've seen grow for many years and now they're at the top of their game, right? Mm-hmm. But this is him just coming back to it after being gone from it the majority of his life. And this is his first performance back. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm, I'm dead serious when I say I want, uh, probably he would get like best supporting actor. Now mm-hmm. I want it. I want it. Yeah. For him. <laughs> I mean, ideally he would get best lead actor because he really is in, in, in most ways kind of a co-lead as well. Uh, and I would say best lead actor, just so we can give um, James Hong some love as well for Best Supporting Actor. Because on that note, James Hong himself gives one of his best performances. And he is 93 years old. He's 93 and he's still acting his ass off. He's he's great in this film. <laughs> Wow. Like, truly. Mm-hmm. Not just, like, you know, in, in the way that James Hong usually is, but he, he gets some material to work with here that he rarely gets himself. Mm-hmm. He gets some emotion in there, too. Like, there was this, this, is, this exchange that he had with Evelyn about, like, how do you think I feel? Like, this is my granddaughter. Mm-hmm. Like, this is a, a different... Um, he plays different versions of, of the character, obviously, with the multiverse being come in here, but there are moments where it's like he, he pulls you in. It's like... This is a 93-year-old man right now that is making me feel this. And it's just, like, it's incredible. Like, like these people are veterans of this industry. And while James Hong has been the one that has consistently worked the most, I would also say to a degree all three of them, with Hong, Quan, and Yo, are examples of of people who have been underappreciated and undervalued in this industry um, and taken for granted for decades upon decades. And I just think it would be a remarkable story if all three of them in some way, somehow were recognized Mm -hmm. for that because their, uh, their work in this film wouldn't just be recognizing you know, the length of their careers. It just so happens that their work in this film is probably one of their all-time best out of a long career, a long list of movies, in, in the case of Yo and Hong in particular. Yeah. With Hong, it shouldn't even be a question. He should have been given an honorary Oscar just for the credits of that he's been doing his whole life. Yeah, I, that's why I said I, he needs an honorary Oscar because he, he's, he's a legend. He's a Hollywood legend. The amount of things he's acted in and come out in is just no one has had it as a prolific a career as him, and, and many have tried. So he, yeah, he needs recognition of some sort, I believe, and soon, fast. He's not getting any younger. Yeah. <laughs> It's just that the sad reality is we only have we'll only at best have him for a few more years. Mm-hmm. He's in his early nineties. Like you don't live much longer than that, unfortunately. And I, as much as I'd love for him to live forever, he won't. And I would love for him to feel celebrated when he's alive, not when he's gone. Yeah. And I, honestly, no one deserves it more than him, because he's one of those few people that you see on screen, and you know exactly what kind of person he is. Mm-hmm. You feel it. You feel it in his warmth. Um, gosh, I, it's just like he's ninety three. Just imagine if, 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 if like you are lucky enough to be that age and be that alert and active and just loving life like he is. Like I think Dick Van Dyke's like ninety six now, and he's still like kicking, like literally, like yeah, <laughs> <still>. wow. <laughs> Like where do these guys like, do? They, do they like leech off like Scientology? Like it's, um, it's all the um, reserves. 
children, sacrificial children's virgin oh, yes. blood. Thank you, QAnon, for uh, what, giving us the, the from the Hillary, secret. Hillary's secret supply. She provides for the rest of Hollywood, even though she looks older than James Hong. Yeah. Oops, that may, that may have been a bit rude, but yeah. Uh, I don't when you, care. When you live off, when you live off souls, when you live <laughs> off the the blood of unicorns, it'll do something. Yeah. Um, Stephanie, by the way, this is her first big feature, and um, and and the multiverse that she's been assigned with, a variation of her character is the main antagonist, mm-hmm. and what an impression she makes. Yeah. What an impression she makes. Cause she she plays, as far as like the range, it's pretty difficult. Because you have to oh, be yeah. sort of the, the unassuming sympathetic daughter, mm-hmm. you know, in this whole situation. And you also have to be this knower of everything. All there is and there ever was, evil entity. <laughs> yeah, and that's just about as far apart as you can. As two characters as you can think, right? Mm-hmm. But um, she's able seamlessly to move between both of these characters. And yeah, she's relatively unknown, you know, especially in comparative to all the legends around her. Yeah. And she more than is able to hold her own. It's, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's... That's... I. That's, That's not easy. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's it, it could have been a situation where she was just blown away by the the legendary cast around her, mm-hmm. but if anything, she she more than stepped up to the plate and gave what I would say a very memorable performance. Yeah, um, multi layered as well as you would hope for uh, for this kind of multiversal movie. Um, let's not, of course, forget the always great Jamie Lee Curtis. She's also incredible. Another living legend. <laughs> and I I love everything about her in this movie. <laughs> All love, the versions that she plays as yeah. well. I love her her personality, like her her character when she's yeah. the, the main the auditor. Yeah, the I the, the IRS agent. Yes. Her just her wardrobe, which she's wearing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Her whole look. Mm-hmm. It's just like, yeah, I think um, Jamie Lee Curtis like played it as like, I know an, I- an IRS agent like that. I think maybe everybody does. Mm-hmm. Or may. And it came across as pretty authentic. <laughs> just everything with her is, is so great. And, and she, she has so many unbelievable... She has some of the silliest moments. <laughs> In the film, yeah, by far, yeah, juxtaposed to some of the most like tender and emotionally moving moments. Surprisingly tender and emotional. Surprisingly, moment. I think that's the that's the key word. Surprisingly, because this character that she mostly plays here, um, is not somebody you would expect. The level of compassion and generosity that she shows several times over. Mm-hmm. toward uh this family that quite frankly considering what she's um uh, she, the things that she's been um how she's been treated shall we say by this family namely one individual you could hardly blame her for not wanting to be over sympathetic considering what she's been exposed to mm-hmm. or at least kind of the treatment but yet we see her be above all else kind uh, to people who are at, at their lowest moment. Mm-hmm. And they kind of like, there's this particular scene toward the end of the film where she has a bonding moment with um, with Evelyn. Yeah. No, and the, it kind of brings it all back together. That's one of the emotional moments where it's like, fuck, I wasn't expecting this. And it just creeps in and it's it's moving. It's moving because it's just very just human moments. You know, of just people connecting in ways you would have never expected. Yeah, it is a film that 
correct me if I'm wrong, it is like a little under two and a half hours, right? It's a little over to, I don't know, a little under, a little under. Yeah, but at times it does, it, it, it does feel long. In, in certain segments, it does feel long, but not the kind of, um, not in a way where I'm like, <sighs> that the length itself is like hurting the overall quality of the film, at least for me. Like it does, you feel its length. And sometimes while you're watching the film, you may think, um, you're not necessarily sure about where it's going to go. But for the most part, I don't care. Because I think, like, I loved everything about mm. it. So, I mean, if you want to knock it for something, sure. It can feel long. But I'm only ever concerned with if everything feels long if my time is being wasted. Or if I'm bored. Yeah. The, the, the movie needs to be as long as it needs to be. But it's always moving, though. Yeah, like it really. It, it, I mean, even you could say perhaps it slows down toward the third act, only because maybe it has to. But for the most part, it's pretty frenetic um, as it's moving and moving and moving. And everything here, it's it's like it, like nothing that they show you is wasted. Like you don't realize it, but the second time, there are so many clues about where the film is is going, not just in terms of like thematic. Uh, wise, but then also with actual like physical representations on the set or on on screen that are like, oh, this is where. It... Even I noticed the blocking of a lot of the key characters, um, in and out of the laundromat, um, and how like w with pretty like uh important conversations, um, are staged. I, I mean, at first I thought that these these pretty seismic moments happened at the end of the film, but when I saw it again, I realized. Oh, these exact same moments were staged here at the beginning, like the exact same blocking of it. And it really just gives you the impression of that attention to detail um, that Daniels um, did very, very well here. And I even heard stories of like, because look, a lot of this film is in the editing process. And from what I think I, I, I heard Jimmy Lee Curtis talk colliders that Daniels were like editing this film, not only like for reels while they were filming, but also in their minds and that every shot that they got, they knew how they were going to use it. And that's not easy. No, not by any means to mm -hmm. shoot everything that you know, you're going to need and to have the editing already in your mind before you actually go into the editing bay and cut it together. Well, I was even thinking like, I would love to read the script because the way they they're just always moving and cutting from the different you know mm -hmm. universes it's like how how does this how does this read well i saw james hong did it on a on a, a press junket say like because he was with uh with stephanie and with um with key and they were both like raving about like how taken they were with the script and james was like well i'm glad you guys enjoyed it but i couldn't make heads or tails of it and i, I guess i'm just old <laughs> reading the script of the of everything everywhere all at once mm -hmm. um <laughs> yeah i mean i i feel him because it's just watching it like it, it's a lot obviously it's, it's a film it's a visual medium it's a lot easier to yeah. understand what's, what's going through while you're watching it than when, when you're, you're watching it, it probably yeah but reading it I, I just imagine like the jump to each universe like how much how ridiculous that would feel reading it and and how easy it could get to be to get lost but James Hong, I mean, he'll he'll <laughs> he'll do anything. I'm I was gonna ask. It's like it seems like he says yes to anything. Yeah, he, he just, just wants to work. He just likes working. I think he probably tried to read it. He's like, uh, okay, he just <laughs> throw it on the docket <laughs> with uh, with twenty other movies. <laughs> so yeah. I don't know if we want to get into like actual specificity because with a lot, you know, I know some from some of our friends listen to this conversation, and I mean to be fair to them, um, well, Kyle doesn't, um, but <laughs> uh, with as far as David and Alexis are concerned, um, they only ever listen to this uh, after they've seen the film, so I don't know if we really need to tread with like any more specificity we want to get into, like any kind of particular gags that worked or didn't work for us. 
I mean, I've talked about the details of, of one guy. and, and Sure. And that's, that's just a, one of many. That's one of right? many, many, many. Like there was some, there was some that that worked from a, well, actually a lot of it worked from a level of cringe, shall well not necessarily cringe, but just like whoa, maybe maybe disgust, shall we say? Because one of the things that I, so that's established as um, part of how people here Damn. are able to absorb what uh, no, well absorb skills from their other multiversal counterparts is they use pain to. To access the multiverse, basically? Not pain. Or what? It just has to be a random act. It has to be random? Yes. So, okay. All right. That's why, because in one instance, Evelyn blows somebody's nose. Mm-hmm. And that's what gets it triggered up. And in some cases, and this is one of the moments where it's like, our audience is just like erupting in laughter. It was random, but it's like, this is... um. This was uh, in the main office space, which, by the way, they made the most out of that. Oh, set, God. Didn't they? Yeah. That building. And, they, and, and yeah, it didn't feel small in the least. Um, but this is a hilarious instance where um, Evelyn is fighting off these two guys that are basically trying to jump on an. Um, what, what would be the appropriate term to describe it to Peter? Um, an award. I know. Yes, but the trophy. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, You're trying to... earlier in the film, there's a very one-off <laughs> gag. Yeah. <laughs> where you see these like IRS awards, and they're very clearly in the shape of a certain item that might be stuck in a certain orifice for pleasure. Um, that's, that's the most sophisticated way that I could describe it. And you think that's like a one-off gag, right? Cause and it, it works as a one-off. Yeah, it's a one -off, It's funny, right? And then they bring it back around in the most unexpected way when in the middle of a fight, they need to do a random, a specific, spe they need to do specific random acts in order to access, to jump to their other universe counterparts with specific skills, this skill being the fighting skill, their jump method had to be to um, <laughs> uh, use said trophy as it seems it was intended to be. They need to put the bug plug in their ass. Yeah. <laughs> and what you see is the guys take off their pants yeah. and literally jump on it. In, in the and, middle of this amazing kung fu fight. Yeah. He, he, the the goal between the fighters is to <laughs> see who can stick their trophy up their ass first. Mm hmm And the audience we saw it with, of course, howling with laughter yeah <laughs> i was like oh my god i can't believe they're gonna do this. it <laughs> oh my god they're really doing it it's like whoa yeah there's a that's crazy there's a lot of that kind of stuff where you think like this shouldn't be allowed right like right. it's yeah. it's too low brow it, it's yeah. too silly well the hot dog fingers yeah the, the hot dog fingers it's too silly, it's too referential in some cases. It, it's too this, it's too that. It shouldn't work. And not only that, it's just something that... It's not that only that it shouldn't work, but it's that, like, it would... It's just frowned upon, right? Like, yeah, it, it, it shouldn't... Someone, someone said that a lot of this stuff would feel more welcome with the uh, genre of Jackass. Yeah. Which I'm pretty sure they make references to Jackass within the the movie <laughs> um it, it's just one of those things where it's like should should i be watching this like i don't it's it doesn't seem like it like yeah like this isn't how it's supposed to work this isn't how mm -hmm. movies are supposed to work and these movies are like no f why not it, it, yeah it, 
they employ such a why not attitude to the their filmmaking and it, it's it's for lack of a better word it's sort of freeing yeah. watching the film just just to see it sort of do its own thing but also just do whatever it wants to do and you know mm-hmm. sometimes it's that means having a uniquely emotional moment between two complex characters preceding uh a scene in which there's a kung fu fight in which both participants are trying to land on a butt plug well there is this other sequence where um i think stephanie as joy or uh, as the multiversal joy what she's using like dildos to like beat oh yeah she's using dildos to beat a guy to death um while striking a pose yes (laughs) that character has a phenomenal entrance Really, and she walks in with a pig and everything. Yeah, well, and, and yeah, just yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh. I mean, part of the central, pe- uh, like centerpiece of the film is a uh, everything bagel. She put everything on a bagel. Yeah, because she could. Hmm. And and oh yeah, and that's another thing. Like the 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 bagel very much represents like the void like just almost depression that yeah. feeling of like nothingness and meaningless nothing matters and just nihilism incarnate yeah <laughs> a, a, a black hole bagel um so even though the adventure itself starts out very literal and it stays mm-hmm. pretty literal up until the end mm-hmm. during the third act so much of it is just feels very um symbolic right when she's fighting her daughter and to stop her from falling into the the everything bagel it's her reaching out to her daughter to save her from sort of the the sadness within her, you know. Yeah. Um. So it's th- that whole third act is basically, and again, not to not to crap on other things, mm-hmm. but like since you know it's been mentioned several times over again, it's kind of like the antithesis of most um, Marvel third acts. <laughs> Yeah, of course. Especially with like the the fighting too, right? Yeah. The point isn't that she became the greatest fighter ever. It's the, it's, she learned to fight with love, with kindness. Mhm. Um, the point is is that she got her family back together. Yeah. And are happier than ever. That's the story, guys. That's kind of what it all means and I think like two of my favorite moments in the whole film, I think we're touched on briefly, but like I was so blown away by key um, when he's talking to Evelyn, one of the multiversal Evelyn's all of this happening in the montage. Well, um, Waymond key's character talking about this whole, like compassion, you know, monologue and everything. Mm-hmm. And then of course, um, Evelyn talking to her daughter and getting her back. Just wow. Wow. Like, wow. Wow. Yeah. This is a must see. Um again, talk about the proclamations that we've we've already made. I said off the bat, it's one of my favorite films I've ever seen. It'll be hard that this gets knocked off my top spot of the year. Peter said immediately it's one of his favorite films of all time. And I don't think any of that is exaggerated at all. We've had a couple of days to think about this, and um, it's a moment. It's a paradigm shift. It's an event. It's a great story. Um, this is kind of everything I want a movie to be. Well, yeah, one hundred percent. Anything else? 
that we forgot. Of course, I should. I think I already mentioned the score is phenomenal. The score is a big part of all of these moments, and wow. Well, have you gone and listened to it again? Uh, the score itself, no. You but should. I remember it's... during the film, it's like I'm loving this music. Yeah. Yeah. So, that ends our review of Evelyn Wang in the Multiverse of Madness. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny there's some pretty overt similarities besides the multiverse oh, a- sure. aspect yeah. of, between this and what that film will be like but you know I can't wait to see it again can't wait to, to own it um, yeah. I can't also wait this this has to be one of the immediate ones that we do for our audio commentary series coming up this summer yeah yeah for sure yeah, yeah we're gonna bring that back this summer and get some more audio commentaries of some films we've been needing to like sit down and watch together. So I also can't wait for David and Alexis to see it. I I guess it's not open around them. Is it? No, it is. It is. It is. is. They need to fucking get on that. Yeah. I bet you though, they'll see it before Kyle finishes peacemaker. (laughs) I, I mean, give me a, (laughs) give me a hard bet. Yeah, basically. Right. All right. Well, um, Thank you all for listening once again to our show. We're so appreciative that people would actually come listen to our thoughts, but I think that's uh, where we land on with this uh, everything, everywhere, all at once. And as a reminder, of course, you can listen to our podcasts every single Sundays. We've got recaps of Moon Knight coming up with David, and of course, Peter, Kyle, and myself will sit down and tell you what our favorite films of 2021 were. Um... Have a great April, guys. We've got more movies also coming up in 2022. So stay tuned under our red spotlight, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye.